Good morning, good afternoon. I am Ana Flavia Nogueira, director of the Center for Innovation on New Energies, CINI, a successful partnership between São Paulo Science Foundation and Shell. So it's my pleasure to start the series of 2021 CINI webinars. And today we have notable speaker, uh, Professor Prashant uh, Kamat. Uh, today is a very special occasion for me for two reasons. First, because of our speaker, and, and second, because uh, this webinar is, uh, has also the support of the Brazilian Materials Research Society, as many of you know as SBPMAT, Sociedade Brasileira de Pesquisa em Materiais. Our society organizes every year the Brazilian MRS meeting. Unfortunately, this year is going to be uh, online. But we hope that in 2022, the BMRS is going to be uh, in person in Iguazu Falls. And as I invited uh, to join our stage today, uh, Professor Monica Cota. She's uh, president of the Brazilian, uh, uh, Brazilian Materials Research Society. Monica, she's going to, to, to deliver some few words about what our society is doing in order to promote science, especially focusing on uh, the young scientists. So, Monica, thank you for the support of the, our society uh, to support the, the webinar today. And I pass the words to you. Okay, Anna, thanks a lot for the invitation, for joining CINI. CINI is a very nice initiative because it brings innovation and we need desperately in our country science, technology, innovation. So uh, I believe the science is an investment as most scientists do, but I also believe that the investments are mostly focused on people. So people are our most resourceful uh, uh, need. And, uh, SPP Mat or Brazilian MRS has started this campaign because we all the, in the director's board share these feelings to promote awareness of what is happening for the future generations in the country. So uh, last year we started showing some statistics on uh, how our PhDs are, how many PhDs we're having and what, what is happening to them, how is the funding for new scholarships and so on. Uh, and we're trying to show new ways how we can handle the crisis because we cannot keep in the country the people we are forming. I just sent you uh, former PhDs to Europe, right? So uh, we have this brain drain that is happening because of the situation of the country. So I invite you to look at the uh, BMRS webpage and our campaigns and the social networks. Uh, I also uh, invite you to look at what is the Brazilian Society for the Progress of Science or SBPC in Portuguese is doing because they're doing a wonderful job working with uh, the Congress, you know, finding people who really share those feelings about science, uh, what science technology means for the country. And uh, just to remind you, there will be a Twitter, a tweetasso today at eight o'clock uh, about the <laughs> proposal for uh, a video for the, the cuts in the FNDTC, which is a funding, a very important funding for science in Brazil. So uh, please be aware of that, help us to participate, to make noise about this. But also, uh, well, I want to share that in next month or so, we'll be posting the news uh, shortly. We will have uh, some lives and webinars uh, about entrepreneurship and innovation for young people. We're just uh, trying to get people to share their stories and how we can do that in a country like Brazil. So anyway, uh, I go back to Ana and I'm very pleased to see this kind of, in, uh, you know, uh, I am. I, I missed the word now, <laughs> this kind of initiative, but also pleased to see Anna. Uh, female directors are not that you know, uh, frequent in Brazil. So congratulations on your, your oh, most as director of the CINI. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> thank you, Monica. Thank you for, and, and thank you for, the, for what, everything that uh, you're doing uh, as a president of the, our our society in, in pro of the science in Brazil in this really really bad moment that we are we are passing through now, thank you Monica, and we are looking for more initiatives between uh, our center and uh, the Brazilian Materials Research Society. 
so as, as I mentioned before, we have a notable speaker and he's also a member of the International Advisory Board of our center, Professor Prashant Kamat. He's going to speak about how you can build a successful career after the PhD and the postdoc. And I think it's a very pertinent, uh, pertinent uh, topic, especially here uh, for the Brazilians. Let's say some, uh, thank you, Kamat. Thank Let's you. say some words um, about my colleagues, Professor Kamat. He's a professor of science in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, University of Notre Dame. Um, he, he earned his uh, PhD in 1979 in physical chemistry from Bombay University. And after two successful postdocs in Boston University and University of Texas, he joined the Notre Dame University in 1983. And it's amazing, Kamat, that you've been there for 30 years. This, this is not usual with the... The Mary, they, they move a lot. So yeah. Professor Kamat is there for more than 30 years, uh, working in physical chemistry, material science to develop advanced and nanomaterials that promise a cleaner and more efficient light energy conversion. Uh, Professor Prashant has published more than 450 scientific papers, is very well recognized in our scientific community with more than 70,000 citations. Uh, according to Thomson, Professor uh, Kamat, uh, Thomson Hilter, for him as one of the most cited researchers in, in, in uh, during 2014 and 2020. Uh, Professor Prashant now she, he's uh, currently uh, serving as editor in chief of ACS uh, Energy Letters. Um, has received many many prizes. This amazing curriculum, and as I mentioned before, is our member of our international advisory boards. So thank you for accepting this invitation. We're looking for your talk. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Anna. And uh, thank you, Monica, for uh, the kind introduction, as well as for the opportunity to uh, speak to you. So it's been a pleasure to be associated with the your center and I hope uh, more new things will come up uh, in the near future and I'm also looking forward to the meeting in Iguazu Falls uh, since last year so uh, I'll be there. Um, uh, with that I want to start my talk uh, and uh, as you can see the title is a little different than a scientific talk. I thought that uh, I will sort of address more to the younger audience uh, starting from people who do PhD and how to succeed in their career. And uh, this is very important. Most of the time you think PhD is only about uh, doing research, publishing papers. No, there is much more than that because it's becoming very competitive and you need to leave, lay the foundation very early on to be successful. It's not that after you finish your PhD, it's too late. So that's what I'm going to talk to you today. Uh, and uh, again, there is a disclaimer here that these are my suggestions and uh, practices and approaches vary. So you have to exercise your own judgment. So this is not something that will fit in everyone, but there is always some good points that you can pick up. So feel free to disagree with some of the points if you like to, but uh, uh, take it from a, uh, perspective that this is from my experience, I'm telling you these ones. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you can see my slide, right? Okay. Uh, no. No? I think, uh, did you share the, the, did you share the slides? Yeah, I said share. That's all okay. Okay, now can you see? Yes, yes, now we can see. Okay. Um, yeah, this is uh, just to show my scientific journey. Uh, and I mentioned briefly, uh, I was born in a very small village near Goa. And uh, Goa, for you, it was a Portuguese colony, just like uh, Brazil. And uh, still there are a lot of words in our language, uh, Portuguese. So whenever, last time I visited Brazil, so I could uh, learn a lot of uh, familiar words. So 
uh, I was educated in India, and uh, as you can see here, uh, I traveled from, uh, uh, let me take my pointer, uh, give me one minute. Okay, so I traveled from India all the way to the Boston, then to Austin, then came to Notre Dame and got stuck here. Uh, but this is sort of a, from my uh, home place. You know, we also have nice beaches on the West Coast, nice mountains. We still have unpaved roads. Uh, just to give an idea that uh, how uh, uh, it makes you uh, a lot of things. And there was a if anybody's interested, I got an autobiography in a special issue of Jeffrey's Camp. And one of the key thing to note for nowadays younger generation is, uh, for most of the my age, people will say that uh, there was no TV, there was no uh, uh, any outdoor entertainment. So basically, we ended up in playing uh, and finding our own ways to do it. So as a result, I picked up a lot of things. So pro probably. That was the early on uh, where my curiosity in different things started. So just want to acknowledge that. Uh, okay, now coming back to the talk, as I said, this is sort of geared towards uh, joining PhD, during PhD and after PhD, and how do you become successful? And a lot of people have just recently joined or will be joining. So for them, it is just the beginning. And you need to ask uh, two important questions uh, in this one is, why should I, what should I do to stay ahead of competition? Because there is, if you look around, there are so many other students and whenever you want to succeed, you need to stay ahead of competition. And then the second one you need to think about is what you are going to do after PhD. Don't say that I want to do a postdoc. Postdoc is again a transient thing, but you need to have a long-term goal, whether you want to go for a company job, you want to be a consultant, you want to be a journalist, you want to be a scientist, you want to be a academic job. So based on that one, you have to decide and pursue that. So what I'm saying is you need to make best of your uh, opportunity that you are getting during your PhD time. That's like four to five years it takes. And uh, that five year time period, you can do a lot more than just research. Uh, again, in the first four to six years, you have to learn new skills of your experiments, uh, develop your research program. You have to be at the time, I tell my students at the end of their PhD, they should be an independent scientist. So they should be able to run an independent project. So that's a skill you need to develop. You need to do record keeping, execution of new ideas. Uh, then same time, you also develop communication skills. You need to learn how to write. You need to write uh, how to present your data. They saw your group meetings. You know, people will sort of comment you on uh, how uh, you have to work towards it. Uh, you need to develop some outreach opportunities. You have to develop leadership. You know, organizing small symposium among students, uh, journal club. So get into that kind of a mode, not um, uh, just listen and just do uh, research in the lab. So uh, this will lay you the foundation for a successful career. So. Now, what I will do is I will first go into your start of your PhD, then uh, like publications, and then I will go to your career. So these are the three parts I will talk today uh, during this one. Okay, getting started with PhD, just the basic. Uh, this is an article in Chronicle of Higher Education, and uh, uh, feel free to uh, distribute these slides and uh, for the link, Otherwise, just type uh, welcome to graduate school and this one in the Google, you will find the article. It's a nice article for a beginner. It tells you that doing PhD in science is a very unique opportunity and not many professional uh, 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 programs have this opportunity. Uh, so this phase of 
directed reading, mentorship, fostering your creative, intellectual, and personal goals, you can get it. And another thing is don't feel comfortable because graduate school is a stage and not the destination. So you are here to make use of that one. Okay, so I'm just starting from the, when you join the uh, university, suppose if you come to Notre Dame, the first thing you do is you have orientation and then first three months you have to talk to different researchers. And this is most of the other places is you have to make a decision what kind of research you want to do. This means you have to select the research group that is will fit your interest. So there are a lot of chances. For example, if you want to be an organic chemist, you have to go to an organic chemist professor. If you want to be a physical chemist, you want to be a physical chemistry, even physical chemistry, spectroscopy, or electrochemistry, or energy, materials. So there are various sub-disciplines. In that sub-discipline, again, there is a narrower one. So remember, whatever you make the decision in the first year will brand you when you get out. People will you call you as a spectroscopist, material scientist, synthetic chemist, uh, by, uh, again, uh, uh, inorganic chemist. So this brand you will carry after five years. So that's why it's very important to make the decision in the first year. Uh, again, uh, then once you start your research, then you have to see uh, what kind of uh, uh, scientific issues that needs to be tackled. Uh, judge your strengths, weaknesses early on and get some support, take some courses, uh, discussions, all those things. Another one is challenge yourself, prepare to tackle a major problem, not something that's very easy that you are to pursue because that's where at the end of the run, you get the credit. And they always say, think outside the box. That means if your group is working, always try to think something other than what's currently being done. So that will give you more rewarding experience. And then there is also a cartoon here that says, unless you are a cat, then cat means you have to be in the box. So you will see a lot of cartoons, you know, just to keep you entertaining. So. Uh, here is uh, uh, a 2020 Nobel Prize uh, uh, Professor Jennifer Dodna. Uh, she made a comment. She says, I think you can put scientists into two buckets. One is a type who dives very deeply into one topic uh, for their whole career, and they know it better than anybody else in the world. Then there is the other bucket where I would put myself, where it is like you are in a buffet table, and you see an interesting here and there and you do it. So basically you have tried different things as well as focusing on certain aspect in a broad sense. And then when you have these different buckets, then uh, you have at least one or two ideas that will uh, prosper. So just to keep, there are different approaches in research when you're choosing a research project. Uh, once you start a research project, then it comes execution. How do you execute your research? My suggestion is start with something simple experiments. Try to repeat somebody's experiments done in the lab or somebody elsewhere. Believe me, you will never repeat exactly the same way as the other person did. In that process, you might encounter something new phenomena. It has happened to me when I started research and then you start asking questions. So that is where your thing comes, is ask a lot of questions, uh, whether the sample is uh, emitting or what are the wavelengths to probe, or if the material you are making is catalytically active, or why not it is not active in certain conditions. So you ask a lot of questions that leads it. After this qualitative test, carry out some very planned experiments. So in order to test it, you don't have to be very careful, just methodically. But once you know something works, then you have to be do very methodical that somebody else can reproduce. So uh, this is one thing. Uh, remember to carry out blank experiments. A lot of times we are swayed by our opinion. We are biased whenever we are doing experiments. That's why you do blank experiments, control experiments. If you are doing in light, make sure that in the dark also it does not go. So that way you can do it. Uh, plot or tabulate the data. Repeat each experiment several times before drawing a conclusion. 
discuss with your advisor colleagues to get their feedback because of their experience they can tell you oh uh, you need to try this you know uh, because just because you see something uh, and you have used that material doesn't mean that that material is causing there may be other effects that may be happening uh, what they say is trust but verify every interesting observation uh, there is an uh, editorial in the Journal of Catalysis. It's called Burden of Disproof. As a scientist, you are always geared towards proving something, right? So you want to prove uh, your observation and conclude based on it. What this article points out is you also have to rule out all other possibilities that might contribute. So take, for example, Louis Pasteur's comment, when you believe you have found an important scientific fact and are feverishly curious to publish it, constrain yourself for days, weeks, years, sometimes. Fight yourselves, try to ruin your experiments and only proclaim your discovery after you exhausted all contrary hypotheses. That means you have to rule out other possibilities. So whenever I say we find an observation, I ask the students saying that, what are the possible? Let's list them. Say five different things can happen. And then we test one. Okay, rule out. Test two, rule out. Test three seems to work. Then four and five, they may not do it. Then only we confirm that fourth one is, or third one is the right one, uh, depending upon the situation. So the burden of disproof is a very important part of research. That's what I'm trying to convey. Another one is you have to be your own critic. It is not the reviewers or your thesis committee members. They should be criticizing you. Just like when you get up in the morning, you get ready. You look in your mirror. How do I look today? Okay, my hair is not right. So I just brush my hair or my collar is not right. So I'm trying to put it. So I'm criticizing myself looking at the mirror and trying to be the best. Same way in research, you are your own best critic. So you have to question yourself. And I call it as the W's. Okay, before you do an experiment, you have to ask yourself a question, why I am doing this experiment? The answer should not be that my advisor told me so, okay? So you should know why you are doing that specific experiment. If not, stop it right there, go back to your advisor and discuss more about the validity of that experiment. Then the second one is what is the right approach? Because the same experiment can be done in a many different ways. So you have to film the right experiments. And if you notice any uh, uh, mishap, you know, something, the power goes off and on write it down the power went off and came down or somebody came and knocked off something or change the sample change the baseline or something so write it down uh, what are the expected results so anytime you when you do an experiment so you sort of expect certain some things to see and majority of the time it may not be that but you have to have some kind of idea suppose if i'm putting an absorption spectrophotometer i know where it absorption should be around 600 nanometer but when i take it oh, the peak is shifted to the 630 nanometers. So now I start asking question, why did it shift? Did I add something? It is a solvent effect or is some kind of a, a pH effect. So again, these kind of a things uh, lead you to this. Uh, look for unusual behavior trends. No, most of the great discoveries are accidental. This is the biggest uh, thing uh, that happened is, uh, uh, Unfortunately, uh, you know, you cannot think everything before and happen. So uh, look for those unusual behavior uh, that is happening uh, uh, in this one. Uh, what did I learn from this experiment? So finally, when you finish your experiment, you have to draw a conclusion saying how, uh, what did you conclude from that experiment? Uh, data analysis, uh, just because you collected the data does not mean the task is over. So nowadays with computers, uh, you can generate lots of data. I was just talking yesterday to my students and uh, how we used to do it. We didn't have computers when we started. 
everything has to be manually recorded and then plot on a graph paper, even for getting a kinetic rate constant. Uh, nowadays, you can put in a software and then you say, okay, first uh, order exponential fit, it will give you the rate constant, right? So here I have to take the log of that concentration and then plot versus time, draw a straight line, get a slope, and then get it. So it tells you that nowadays you can get a lot of data, which is much easier, but uh, you have to analyze the data, get some quantitative information. If you are following a trend, make sure there are enough data points to show your trend. Uh, discuss the results with your advisor and uh, see whether you want to plot in a graph or a table. You know, both are fine. Questions to ask, is this the best way to present the data? Whenever you have a table, figures. Uh, if you see nowadays trend in the paper is people put like panels and panels of figures. You don't need that because your idea is to convey something, not to show the quantity of data that you have acquired. Uh, sometimes it's even difficult to even see uh, what it is done. Uh, sorry, the data is being presented. So you have to be very clear. And uh, another time I will give you a, another talk on how to draw a good graphics, okay? Uh, we have, uh, uh, there is ways of drawing it. Uh, but I will not talk about that data presentation. How does this set of data compare to the previous data set? Uh, what else can I vary in this set to seek additional information? How do these data compare with blank or control experiments? So these are all questions to ask whenever you finish an experiment and collect data. So uh, again, be prepared for it. And another thing is the artifact, okay? So uh, look at this uh, uh, rhino, right? So he's seeing this big horn and he thinks that Everybody has that one. So in every picture, you start putting this one. So this should not be the case whenever you are doing an experiment. Just because you see something doesn't mean it is right. It could be an artifact. It's the instrument may be just giving you some signal at that particular uh, uh, setting. So you have to watch out for that one. Avoid artifacts. And one of the things uh, we always do is once a year, we all get together and nice having a uh, pizza, beer, or something, and uh, sit together, and uh, we try to brainstorm. And the idea here is come up, everyone has to come up with one innovative or transformative idea, and they should not use any PowerPoint. They should go to like the easel board and write it down. And uh, so, and th that should be not currently being done in the lab. But something related, but that we can do, but not done in the lab. And it could be based on a recent paper or a scientific discussion. And you need to justify why this is breakthrough idea. So this is a good exercise for a research group. So that way you are thinking outside the box and bringing some new ideas into the group. So then you can write a proposal on that and see whether you can get money. So these are some of the things you can do, help the center or your research group, okay? Uh, some useful tips to succeed in graduate research. So we are now finishing almost the uh, graduate studies. You have to be selfish, okay? You have to look from your own point of view. Uh, I tell my students, don't look in front of me. You know, for me, publishing one less paper does not make a difference. For you, it does. So you, and you are working for your degree and I am here to help you, okay? Your advisors are there to help you. So you have to take charge of your research project. Set a weekly goal and evaluate the progress routinely. And nowadays, uh, the computer, you know, I also do it. I'm not saying that I'm not doing it, but during even working hours, uh, if you have spent time on browsing or reading something else, make sure that you put that extra time in the day for your research. Remember, you need to put at least eight productive research hours. This is not the total time when you come in and when you go. This is the time you spend on doing a research. Uh, and it is your PhD. And if you do not take interest, nobody else will. So this is just remember these points during your PhD. So you have to be proactive and doing research, okay? 
And as I said, like you are not there to just run an experiment your advisor tells. You have to generate your new ideas. And another part of the thing is good record keeping. It is fundamental obligation to create and maintain an accurate data so that the next person, when he comes, he can follow it, check it. Sometime it gets audited for somebody complaining, then you can go and tell this is how I did it. Uh, entering data into a bound notebooks or sequentially, now they have got electronic notebooks. I still like the bound notebooks because you carry with you. Electronic notebooks, it remains in cloud. If the company folds, your data is gone. Okay, uh, so we finished sort of some basic aspect of research. I told you how to start your research, choosing the right field, and also choosing the right advisor, and how to take uh, the charge of your project and spend a more uh, 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 with the, uh, uh, all the energy and uh, enthusiasm. Now I will talk to you about uh, research communication. During your PhD, it is also very important to communicate your results to the outside world. And in fact, most of the people are judged by the quality and quantity of publication. And unfortunately, the emphasis is more on the quantity by the administrators, but your peers will look for quality, okay? So hence, the quality to me is more important than quantity. So typically our students publish at least four first author papers. So that's what I tell them that that is considered as a productive if you are a first author, author of four. You know, sometimes some countries, especially in Asian countries, you see the graduate student club boosting claims that, oh, I published 30 papers. Believe me, if you publish 20, 30 papers, you didn't know anything. If you have published four papers, your master how to write that paper, how to do the results. So again, uh, the quality is very important than the quantity if I have to judge it, okay? But the administrators take a different part in this one. But anyway, we'll talk about research publication. Uh, what is a scientific publication? This is something, uh, this is from a National Academy Press in the US. It's called On Being a Scientist. You can just Google it, uh, National Academy Press On Being a Scientist. This is a small PDF brochure. It's a very well uh, done. It talks on more on ethics. Uh, so you can download it and read it. Uh, it's a very good uh, uh, general read. You know, you can read it in a bus or a train or whenever you're traveling. Uh, it says that the object of research is to extend human knowledge beyond what is already known. This is a very important thing. Our emphasis for research is to advance the scientific understanding or scientific knowledge. Not that, you know, if you just take uh, somebody work with ABC and I'm doing with DEF, you didn't advance the scientific knowledge. It is the same thing, you tried a different system. So this is, has to be there. Uh, and individual knowledge enters the domain of science only after it's presented to others in such a fashion that they can independently judge its validity. Here is my one of my favorite quote from Whitesides in Advanced Material in 2004. And this became a very popular article and they wrote how to write a paper. A paper is an organized description of hypothesis, data and conclusions intended to instruct the reader. Okay, so it is a organized form of uh, uh, description of your work. And if your research does not generate papers, it might just as well not have been done. Which is true, you know, if you do all this work and then if you don't publish it, nobody knows about it. So you have a record of what you did. But now we are living in 2020, 2021. And this is what I say, if your paper does not generate citations, it might just as well not have been done. This is because if you publish it, you want people to read your work. And this is where it comes very, Thing is citation. So it is not only you have to do the work, you have to uh, uh, get uh, the work published, and then you have to uh, get the attention of the readers and uh, uh, other peers 
in this one. And uh, this is uh, one of the cartoon, again, as I said, uh, the evolution of academia. In the before 1990s, if you publish it, everybody was happy, uh, it's fine. Then came in 2000, publish or perish, the word became very popular. Then it came uh, published in high impact journals or perish. And now you publish frequently in high impact journals and maybe you won't perish. So see how things are changing even uh, in my lifetime as well as your things. I don't know what will be the next one. Okay, So this is a pressure everybody has. Okay, what is publishable? The journals like to publish papers that are going to be widely read and useful to the uh, readers. Uh, paper that report original and significant findings that are likely to be interest to a broad spectrum of its readers. Uh, perhaps they are well organized, well written, and all those things. Uh, typically, I also give a talk on how to write an effective paper, but I have condensed some of the slides from that one so that you can get in a nutshell uh, what it is. Uh, when I am, am I ready to write a manuscript? Okay, you, when you're working in a group, you have lots of data, when are you are ready? First thing you have to ask yourself, do my data tell a story or are they merely piece of information? If you are piece of information, can you put together like a story? You know, just like uh, anytime you read a story, there is a sort of a, uh, uh, beginning in the middle and the end, right? So same way in your research paper, in the beginning, you lay out your foundations, uh, you set to uh, achieve uh, some kind of or address some scientific issue, you describe how it is, and at the end, you conclude. So it has to fall into a story. As you know, since from kids, we always like stories. This is a scientific story. Don't make it a, just a data presentation report. Uh, do the results I achieved move the state of the knowledge forward? Remember that say that publication is to advance the science. It has to. You have to find out what the data that moves forward. Is this information I've collected relevant to others? Does anybody care? Why should I publish this if nobody cares, right? So you have to bring that interest into that paper when you're writing so that other people can do it. And then you also have to write in a more general leadership. You cannot just write to the 10 people in the field who are working. So that's how the journals like to see is the entire readership uh, will take into uh, consideration. Uh, when you start writing a manuscript, okay? So it's the winter here, uh, we are getting a lot of snow, okay? Sometimes, if there is a blizzard, it's like your driveway or your rooftop will be like this big giant snow. And look at this person trying to shovel the snow to get out, right? So it, manuscript writing is almost same thing. Like it looks like a monumental task. How do I do it, right? So you cannot just one, say one fine day that I want to write a manuscript and I will work on it. No, you have to start early on, very, very early on. Practice, practice, practice. So you can forget everything what I said, but just remember one thing that you need to start writing. For a lot of people, English is a second language, but it so happens that this is the one language we communicate with the entire world, whether it's in Korea, China, Japan, India, Europe, all these different languages, they have one common language that is English. Uh, and again, I don't know why, but it happened that way. So, but we have to follow that way, right? So basically what you do is start writing half a page every day about what you did or what you read. Believe me, if you get into that habit, writing a paper becomes very easy, especially if you uh, read the paper and uh, introduction, you write something, write a couple of lines. They will help you to write your introduction. Same thing with the experimental procedure. You can write it down. That will help you writing the experimental section. The results, whenever you write a figure, write a few sentences below that figure saying, what is that uh, outcome of that one? Only thing you have to do is put together when you're writing a paper. So this is... Uh, uh, you don't run a marathon. 
without practice. You just say, I want to run a marathon tomorrow and you won't run it. The thing that you do is you practice. You practice three months, six months, same way writing a paper. You have to practice well before that you write, start writing a paper. And here is a uh, article from uh, uh, Science. I noticed few senior colleagues who published with impressive regularity and always had a paper in the works. When I asked them uh, uh, what, what their secret was, I found that they prioritized doing small amounts of focus writing every day. I have since developed my own version of this approach. I call it as a one hour workday. Please designate at least half an hour a day in writing and you will be rewarded uh, when you're writing a paper. Okay, so you did all those things and you're ready to write a paper, you have done all the experiments, so now how do you start writing a paper? You have lots of data, right? So now you need to identify two or three different things, findings that emerge from your experiments. And uh, these should not have any words like conducted, demonstrated, investigated, those are all what you did. You have to have a finding. Something like the catalyst I developed has selectivity towards this reaction. That is a finding. Okay. Uh, anything that emerging as a major finding, you identify that. And those ones will go into your abstract, those findings. And now you see what kind of data I need to support those findings, okay? So uh, that you compose those figures and discuss those results and then it becomes a paper, okay? The limit number is six to eight is a good number of figures and most of it is you can put it in the supporting information. Do not dilute your main results with lots of data then people lose focus and interest. You don't know where to focus. As I said earlier, it is a trend now. I see papers, each figure will have like 12, 15 panels. You don't need that. I don't know which panel should I be focusing on when I look at the figure. If you have only two panels, I can focus on those two panels. And if I need more information, I can go back into supporting information. So designing your figures and selecting the right figures is the key uh, to your strength of the paper. And another thing you should notice is the readership of the journal that you are considering to publish your work because that's the way you are going to highlight these ones and discussions uh, goes in into that. Another one, it is important to know the focus of your paper. Okay, when you are writing it, what are you focusing on? Again, this is from a, uh, some quote, uh, it takes a wise man to know whether he has found a rope or lost a mule. So you can write a story on a person who has found a rope, or you can write a story on the mule who ran away, right? So uh, establish the focus of your research paper before you engage in writing. Start with working title, just create one, working title check and revise after you complete writing. So that is your focus. The title is the one that you think this one. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Again, uh, if it is in the audience, I would have uh, picked up somebody and said, uh, ask you people, what is it? What draws your attention first while browsing a scientific journal? Any journal, right? What attracts you first? It is the title. So you have to put a lot of efforts in making that title. So it is a bait, you know, just like when you're catching a fish, you throw a bait and then it will catch, right? If it has to be the right bait. Same way you have a title can attract readers. It can attract the attention of editors. It can attract the attention of reviewers. Why it is significant. Don't make it too boring, too long. Okay, so I, you can see how it is. So in newspapers and magazines, same news is spun with different titles, whether it's a conservative, liberal, or um, center, 
same story they will put in a different way so that their readership will get that stories same news is spun in different ways so same way with your scientific paper same work can be focused on different ways and uh, then the abstract right keep it short and effective don't give all the data nobody who is a general reader is interested is if you are doing battery they're giving all capacity discharge behavior if you are solar cell open circuit voltage and currents and different conditions no you put your findings what is that new thing you are doing it so here is a anatomy of abstract the first sentence should propose a and problem statement what is this work is about that is your first sentence okay that draws the attention then you can have three or four sentences highlighting that major findings of your work and the methodology you have used to describe that and then finally one sentence about why should someone care about this that's your conclusion something like if you are making solar cell material okay this material can be used in solar cell development or if you are making a catalyst material you can just say that this material you can be used for uh, improving the selectivity and efficiency of uh, this particular catalytic process think about the big picture when you are writing your abstract not a narrow specialized audience the bigger the picture the more broader audiences and the editors and reviewers like it okay so the title and the abstract make a big impact then there is a toc graphics in a lot of people blame oh why this journal wants a toc graphic it is not the journal that wanted it it is the readers the younger generation they didn't have much time to read the paper tell me a story in a small uh, capture of a figure right so that's where it came from it came out only in the last 10 years or so and this is an opportunity for you to highlight how it looks for example it is a uh, this one is my favorite carbon support and putting a platinum when you look at the figure they carbonize it with the ionic liquid and i can get the story what this paper is about right so here i know it is a water uh, uh, electrolyzing the water by uh, semiconductor photoelectrolysis so it can be a scheme so it should be simple and very illustrative okay uh, this is uh, when Al albert einstein with charlie chaplin okay so the einstein tells uh, uh, the charlie chaplin says what i most admire about your art is your universality you don't say a word yet the world understands you and the charlie chaplin responds true but your glory is even greater the whole world admires you even though they don't understand a word what you say right so your toc graphic should be charlie chaplin so just looking at it uh, people should see what it is about and uh, you get i stand could be in your paper and other things but the toc graphic should be there look at here these are cluttered uh, toc graphics nobody can attract you know this is just, it's not a collage of figures that you should do it you should uh, be and uh, use this opportunity to take a good toc graphics now comes which journal to submit you know you made this paper and everything uh, scope of your research understand in which field and subfield your findings will have the greatest impact okay that is important then i'm giving you two titles here same title can be written in two different ways this is phenanthrene covalent organic framework as the first part of your thing right electrodes for high uh, performance zinc ion supercapacitor it's a battery with the supercapacitors uh, this one because it is focusing on this uh, organic framework it is better title for a materials journal if you want to submit to an energy journal focus on the battery or capacitors and then using this one so you can see here how you can tune your same work to a different journal just by rewriting the title and shorter the title is more effective don't try to put conjugates to make it long 
uh, uh, like a short abstract. So I, I could have given you examples, but because of time, I will not go into that one. But again, focus on the journal that you want to submit and think. Okay, so the quick checklist before submission of a paper. Is the title appealing to broader readership? Have significant findings been identified in the abstract? Uh, does introduction provide motivation for the study? Are the figures and schemes scientifically correct and aesthetically attractive? Do the discussion of results and cited references fall within the scope of the journal? Have proper acknowledgments been made? Have all co-authors seen and commented on the final draft of the manuscript? So, once everything is ready, then you can submit your paper and then it gets to the revision and finally uh, you revise it, it gets accepted. But most of the time, it's not the case. Uh, what to do if a paper gets rejected? Don't get discouraged. Read the editorial comments, discuss with your advisor, student, collaborators, find out how you can make the study stronger and acceptable publication. And just to let you know that there is no scientist whose work has not been rejected, including Nobel uh, laureate. So it is a learning experience for all of us. Sometimes we don't write it properly, don't focus it properly. You need to identify how to make it stronger and uh, just don't turn around and submit to another paper because you need to change it. Read carefully the comments, carry out if, experiments if needed. And, uh, 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 sometimes what happens is rejected papers, you can resubmit back to the same journal after addressing the concerns. Uh, we always uh, consider it, uh, at least in ACS energy letters, if you resubmit back, it goes back to the same reviewers. We say convince that reviewers, or if you want new reviewers, we'll get you new reviewers. So uh, this is uh, one thing uh, that goes in. Uh, what to avoid? Uh, try not to data without scientific discussion, application, of data and literature review. Uh, routine synthesis and characterization of nanomaterials or studies that report incremental advance. You know, try to get rid of things like novel, first time, highly efficient. Uh, you know, those are overused words uh, and have no meaning anymore. So it just turns off the reviewer and uh, they will come back. Again, same thing with the names of flowers, fruits, especially in the nanomaterials, it says nano flowers uh, give you, it's not the shape, it is the material that is giving you that activity. Okay, so focus on where uh, the importance is. Uh, this is not a, a vegetable market uh, to sell you the flowers and fruits, uh, vegetables. Uh, my favorite thing was you put it in nano and any of your flower or uh, fruits, you will find a paper uh, on that one, uh, this one, but uh, it doesn't highlight anything new science. Uh, again, the, this is, I think, the last slide on the publication. Uh, there is an article, a uh, collection of editorials uh, that is there. It's a very popular, Mastering the Art of Scientific Publication that I wrote with several uh, other editors. Uh, there are 20 articles uh, telling you right from the title uh, all the way to the citations, uh, how to uh, make it effective paper. So uh, you can write it down or just type Mastering the Art of Scientific Publication and you will get this uh, collection of uh, editorials. And then it, it could be a good you know, group uh, exercise. You know, you discuss each editorial uh, and bring examples. So this way you can improve uh, your things. Well, uh, this is what happens. Uh, you graduate uh, after five years. With, uh, this is again Notre Dame, some of our students. You did all the hard work and graduate, all smiley faces, well and good, and everybody's happy. And all the students, just like the birds fly away from the nest, they go outside world. And that's what it is. All your five years, you can rely on your advisor. Once you go uh, outside world, there is nobody to take you across the street. You have to walk across the street yourself. Okay, and uh, seeking a successful career. You just defended your thesis. And what will be your next career move? How will you uh, secure the position that uh, could lead you to establish uh, a successful career? The ex excitement of completing a major professional degree quickly transitions into a concern of practical reality. Uh, opportunities exist in academia and national labs and institutes 
industries, journalism, a lot of opportunities. The challenge for all new PhDs is to make your skills and experience stand out when you get out. So you need to stand out in front of the crowd. So I wrote uh, earlier another editorial on looking beyond the PhD. So this is a nice one. What you should be doing during your PhD other than research. It is a highly competing world and you need to stand out. And uh, just like any other place in your class, if you take out, there is always a top 10% uh, people get really stand out in the class. Same way here in a group of PhD, you need to stand out. Uh, this was a couple of years back when I told to my group and one of the student uh, raised his hand and said, how can everybody be in the top 10%? I said, exactly. Since everybody cannot be, you can be, right? You have to find a way to stand out among the crowd. And the person who puts the most efforts will stand out, okay? Without putting efforts, you will not. So again, uh, this is a nice article you can take and read uh, very well. Uh, make your choice very early on. As I said, during the PhD, you should be thinking what I will do after my PhD. Whether you want to go to academic, then prepare for academic, start teaching some small courses, tutorials, uh, um, and uh, get ready for that one. Uh, if you want an industrial position, try to seek some kind of a summer internship. You know, take three months off, work in an industry. You know what it looks like. So that adds your resume. Uh, or if you're a small startup company, you know, you can join hands and become an entrepreneur. Uh, technical positions. Uh, instrument development, a lot of instrument companies need it. So you can contact and do an internship. Uh, get You need to develop those skills of fixing the instruments. A lot of spectroscopies uh, become, uh, uh, join the laser companies because during the spectroscopy, they know ins and outs of lasers and that skill got transported them into the laser companies. So that's very important. Uh, marketing and sales force, uh, they also need it. Uh, scientific writer media. This is becoming a major thing is scientific writing, uh, uh, scientific journalism, uh, web designing. Uh, there are a lot of services now. They will draw you nice uh, graphics for your uh, things, but you need to have that scientific mind for doing that. If you like that kind of a thing, scientific art, go for it. Uh, consulting service. A lot of become people become consultants. Uh, entrepreneurship. So these are it's not just academics that is there for PhDs anymore. There are a lot of opportunities and you need to find out what do you like to do after your PhD and pursue that goal. And uh, develop additional skills during your PhD. Uh, good writing skills, proposal writing. You know, if there is any fellowship, write a short proposal, get it the feedback from your advisor and then submit it. Uh, unless you do this exercise, you will not be ready to write a bigger proposal. Uh, again, now big webinar has opened up uh, very much and it's a, a level field now. You can participate in the international conferences and present your data and get a feedback and uh, put that one in the YouTube and publicize it. Uh, mentorship, uh, that is again, if you have a graduate student, our graduate students always mentored undergraduates. It's an opportunity to work with them and teach them how they do it. And uh, so develop those kind of a thing. There may be high school students who wanted to do a science project. So this builds your confidence in being a leader. Uh, and uh, again, leadership qualities comes in different ways. Uh, you can organize short, small conferences, uh, small workbook discussions, uh, or any other activities that you want. Uh, another thing is important is keep a personal statement ready because any job you go, people want to know what did you do, how did you come to this stage, and what you would like to do uh, after you do your interests, your hobbies, anything, a personal statement is important for that. I'm almost coming to an end. Uh, here are seven tips on how to stand out in the crowd. Okay, So you need to stand out in the crowd. Uh, among the other people. Confidence, this is the major part many people have that yes, I can do it kind of a 
uh, approach. And uh, then you need to feel comfortable. In any scenario, you need to feel comfortable. Sometimes you are suddenly seeing a bunch of uh, strangers, uh, well-known scientists. Don't we feel afraid? Most of us would like to talk to everyone. Okay, in fact, in conference, I make it a point if there's coffee or something, go and talk to students, get to know them, what they are doing. So we like to interact with uh, everyone. Uh, don't shy away. Ask questions. Uh, perception. Listen closely of other people are saying around you, and uh, how uh, you can use those kind of a things to your advantage. Trust. People tend to judge one another within a few moments of the meeting. So you have to develop that trust that you have. You have need to have authority. When you speak, speak authoritatively things that you know well about. Okay, And there are three yeses. Stay informed, stay educated, and stay connected. So the stay connected is becoming more now with the social media like Twitter and uh, Facebook and uh, other means are becoming more to connect with the other ones. Uh, happiness, uh, last but not least, don't get stressed out. This is not the everything PhD. So be relaxed. And although I told you so many things to do and everything, you have to do in a relaxing way. Uh, make sure, you know, every day go for a run. I, I still like to go for a run. Uh, that relaxes me. I don't take an earphone. I like to listen to the birds or dogs or cats or whatever the animals. Those sounds really inspire me. Okay. So go outside. If you don't want to run, just take a walk outside. Uh, with a friend or just alone. Uh, try to find a ways to relax uh, in this one. A weekend, go for a hike, go to the beach. You've got in Brazil nice beaches and uh, those ones uh, if you are nearby. Uh, so again, try to find a relaxing path to don't get too much stress while doing all these things. Okay, and uh, this is not the way to stand out, okay? Okay, finally, I want to give you a biggest encouragement, okay? So this was a study done earlier. Um, uh, if you take 221 painters, 100 classical composers, 90 Nobel Prize winning authors, they did it. And uh, they thought that uh, uh, at what age they made that major contribution, okay? They may be getting rewarded at the age of 60 or 70, but their contributions mainly came when they were young. So if you see here between 25 to 35 years is the maximum probability that you can generate new ideas and become very successful. So, you know, I, I am in the corner here. I, I'm done with my new ideas. It is, I'm counting on you people to generate new ideas and be successful. So know your strength and explore with your enthusiasm and new ideas. You need to challenge yourself and generate. So that is my sort of inspiration for you, why you are the future uh, for all of us. And you should be taking more seriously charge and uh, explore uh, this one. And finally, I would like to tell you again, this is from that On Being Scientist from a National Academy Press. Uh, there are three sets of obligation for every researcher. One is an obligation to honor the trust their colleagues place in them. So when you hire as a PhD researcher or in a job, people like to put trust in you that you will contribute sincerely. So you have to have an obligation that you have to have an obligation to yourself. You have come from kindergarten to all your efforts. Don't try to do something stupid, uh, unethical things and blow up everything. And another one is obligation to the society. And that comes from the fact that when you're doing research, it's much easier to call the news media, say, I made a breakthrough for cancer research. Uh, if it is just thing, don't call it. Uh, because the society is looking for as the scientific science to solve the problems. So you have to be really sincere in reaching out uh, and making your disclosures and those kind of things. Okay, so finally, uh, I would like to uh, summarize what I said. Uh, one of the things is uh, whether you are doing PhD or you finished PhD, 
you have to have a courage to get into this one and excel your career. And if you think you can, uh, almost surely you are not going to. Again, you have to have a positive attitude. It is not for me, means then this is not the game for you. You have to have that courage to succeed and uh, look for the positive side of things instead of the negative because everything will have a positive and negative. So you have to be an optimistic and go for it. You need the drive and commitment. Uh, again, according to Edison, a genius is 99%. So the hard work pays off at the end. You have to be communicative with the creative and effective community, communicating uh, skills that you develop to uh, convey your research. Uh, academic honesty and ethics is important. I didn't talk about much about it, but uh, it is part of it. And the career goals, you set them earlier. And you will encounter a lot of problems during the way. So don't ever give up, you know. Thank you very much. So that sort of concludes my talk. Thank you, Professor Prashant, for this very inspiring uh, talk, especially for, for the students, the Brazilian students that are, are listening to us here. Uh, I'm thinking about to print some of your slides and we stick around. I, I, I can send you my uh, talks. So. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it's something I'm going to do and put in the student's office for, for them to, to remember every day. Well, again, you know, like uh, this comes from experience and seeing a lot of people and other things. And there is not that one fine silver bullet that can work. Everyone has to see from their own point of view what works for them. I know, as I said, there is a positive and negative side, but be positive and get your strength and do it. So, uh, so again, I, I hope uh, this is geared towards more younger uh, people. So I hope they... Uh, the senior people will excuse me uh, for yes. telling all the things they already know. We have a, we have a question here from uh, Professor Juarez. How to keep the balance between development technical skills and scientific production, I mean, papers along the PhD? How to find this balance? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. And uh, that's why uh, uh, one of that science quote uh, that said was, uh, uh, they always see the senior people, they're very productive doing different things, right? Uh, there was uh, one... Uh, uh, this is uh, one, uh, the one hour uh, work day. I noticed few senior colleagues who published. So again, doing a little bit of each one uh, need to be doing it. I know that when you are developing technical skills, like uh, 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 especially some people uh, developing new techniques, it takes two years. And during the two years, there is almost no production, especially if you are a young assistant professor. And uh, the good institutes, they recognize that value. And they will tell you, it's okay if you don't publish it, but I want to get that new technique built. Uh, just to give an example, the CERN, right? So there's so many people involved in it. And when they published the paper, there were like 5,342 authors in that paper. And it's a short paper. But it took them years to build that CERN. The same thing if you are building some uh, two-dimensional laser spectroscopy or something similar. It may take you six months to a year to set up your lab, think everything going. And during that time, it's very difficult. But... If I am an assistant professor, I will also keep on the side some small projects for which uh, you can put one or two students and they can do these small projects. And those could be your publications while at the time you can still develop main. So the, again, the game, uh, the rules of the games are changing by daily and depending upon your institution and how administrators demand makes a lot of difference and how to maneuver but keeping these different small little project at the same time is a good idea and when your technical thing comes up that will be your big blockbuster and you can succeed thank you so i have a, a question here from uh dr eduardo machado from unicamp uh 
Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, could you please share your insights into how egoistic uh, behavior from a PhD student would impact uh, the lab as a, as a whole? And I think this is also, we can join this with another question from the other, another doctor, Paulo Marchesi. When you say about be selfish, I think during your presentation, Professor Prashant, you mentioned that it's important for a PhD student to be selfish. And can you comment on this? Yes. Okay. Uh, I will address the selfish part first. You know, the selfishness is uh, something you care about yourself right see I, I have seen uh no i i'm not uncovering much with the brazilian students but uh, things like in asia like china india when you go the students feel that they are working for the professor mm. okay so they are very much obedient and uh, so as a result what they're focusing is well you know i have to do it but if you come in the US, here the students are told first in the beginning, at least in my group, I tell them, it's your PhD. You have to take charge. You have to take from your perspective. That's the selfishness. Is looking from your perspective, what it needs to be done. Yes, you are supported by the funding. Unless you are working eight hours a research lab hours, you will not succeed. You know, I'm telling you, there are a lot of students who are just relaxed. They feel happy that they are in the project. They are five years, they get support, okay? And uh, they feel uh, that uh, they are entitled for a lot of things, which is fine. I tell them, everyone in my group gets a, a five-year uh, PhD. Nobody fails, okay? So everybody gets in. I make sure that they get in. But at the end of the five years, you need to stand out. And the only way you can stand out in the competition is develop something, skills that you can uh, project to the outside world. That's what I mean. You know, that selfish may be a little bit uh, too harsh word, but what it means is you have to see from your own perspective what needs to be done for my career. Because at the end of the five years, you and advisors are separate. You cannot rely on the advisor. You know, this is just like uh, when you are going in a swimming and initially someone will hold you to swim. But once you are, know how to it's, uh, order, then you have to learn yourself how to swim. Uh, so that is kind of a thing uh, made by selfishness. Okay. The, ego, the egoistic is something different. Uh, that is also you encounter. There are students who come in with saying that I know more than my professor. Okay, uh, I have seen sometimes, but these people are not open to the suggestions. Uh, even I tell my students that I don't know any everything. Okay, uh, if I don't know something, I'm not hesitant to tell you that I don't know about this. Let's go and find out somebody who can. Uh, teach us or read some paper about it and we can read about it. So there is nothing wrong. This science is a uh, learning process. Even at the age of 60, 70, it is still a learning process, even for me today. And I learn from students a lot of time. I appreciate them. You know, I said, okay, this is something I didn't know about it. Because of you, I learned. So this is what the uh, 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 thing one should build up with the students. But uh, there are a lot of students who try to uh, judge their uh, uh, intelligence of their advisor. You know, like, of course, I don't know everything in the scientific field. So you may be knowing only part of it very much. And don't put that as an asset to teach uh, the, your professor. So that is, to me, is a more egoistic. And that it becomes very hard and contentious uh, in uh, dealing with it. So. Uh, early on is, uh, I have left these students alone when you encounter this one. Okay, fine. You are smarter. Show me that you can do something. And believe me, if you have that attitude, you will not succeed. You have to be always listen and try to understand things. And because everyone has something to give, whether it's a student or an advisor or a postdoc. 
So we all have to work together, try to develop a good understanding. So again, the egoistic and selfishness are two different extremes, uh, but there must be a balance between the two. And again, the word selfish means that from a, uh, your own point of view and not from a, somebody else's point okay. of view. Okay. We have a question here from uh, Gary. Uh, how to balance between spending too much time in the same buffet buckets to living too early this this uh buckets and it is also this is also my question because i have the impression that nowadays uh, the young scientists even my generation we are more more generalist than we are focusing on a specific topic for your entire career uh, when i look at my, i look in my career so what do you think about it you know, that the things change you know like um, uh, the science always advances at revolutions and one of the things I always uh, joke about is if you want to get a new research project, uh, go back and read uh, 20 or 30 years back papers. OK, uh, and you will find something there that you can come back. So you see, it's, it's a cycle. It continues in every 25, 30 years. The same topics come back. Uh, uh, it's not something new. And I was. Just to give an idea, uh, yesterday I was looking in cesium, lead, uh, bromide, and people have been working in 70s and 80s trying to do the phase transformation of these materials, and everybody forgot about it for 20 years, and now it's back again. So uh, these things happen. And uh, again, coming back to the question is, uh, you need to try different things. It's not that one is more rewarding than the other, uh, but you never know which one will take off. Like right now, uh, just to give an example, uh, when the perovskite thing came up, right? Uh, in 13, uh, yeah, 2014, we joined in. There are only a few people, and it was more fun to join in. Today, it is so much saturated. And uh, if you are there as a newcomer into the field, uh, it takes a lot of things uh, effort to make an impact. Uh, whereas there are already people who are there, they know much more and they've established things. You know, like for example, like in 2014, I used to make solar cells, right? So we published it. Today, the efficiencies have gone up like 25% or more than 22. If I make a solar cell uh, characterization, I will be still the follower of somebody. But in the same perovskite field, there are other things, you know, we are looking into halide ion migration or something. There are scientific problems. So you need to pick the right problem where you can make impact. Just don't follow somebody because it's a popular field. Same thing happened with graphene. You know, like we started graphene uh, very early. It was started with an undergraduate. It was a totally random experiment. We bumped into it and we got it. And uh, that was the first time we put the metal particles on graphene, some magnetic particles on graphene. But then that field exploded. And today, if you are working with the graphene and a semiconductor, uh, you have to find a research problem. So we always uh, look for scientific issues, the things like what scientific question you are trying to understand and how it can be done. So uh, again, uh, when to get out from a bucket is your decision. Like we got out of the graphene. So that bucket was gave us a lot of things, but it got saturated, so we got out. So I'm also reaching in the perovskite world, almost similar thing, is trying to find, again, it's a derivative of that one or something. Because when there are too many people, uh, it's easy to publish, uh, don't get me wrong, but from a scientific satisfaction, you want to be something contributing uh, to the science. And there are always scientific issues, so new things. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a question from Professor Monica. Monica, can you can you can you join us in uh, in ask her question, please? Oh yes, <laughs> I think it's too long. Thanks for the nice talk, uh, Professor Kamat. I was wondering. I recall once I I saw a MRS Medal Award talk from Professor Robert Langer about his career. And he was saying that he, he said that one of the most important things he did was moving to a very different environment for his postdoc. He worked with uh, Dr. Judah Folkman 
in the hospital and they he helped developing the drug delivery for system right but uh i wonder if you could share your thoughts you talk a bit about this uh about how diversity in environment uh, can affect the science uh development for example does he make better could you you know comment on that please i i, I think that's a, that is a very good approach and the right approach if you want to be an independent scientist uh what people are looking is when you come out you don't want to be associated uh, especially in the us is what your advisor is doing right so suppose if my student goes out and tries to do the exactly the similar work then he is competing with me right so and it takes a lot of time you can compete but it takes first few years to establish yourself on the other hand you go to a postdoc for which you want to learn for example i will give an example if you are in materials for example right so you are all the time you are developing materials characterizing and everything but you have an interest to go to a bio or a nano medicine or nano something so you and but you don't have a chemical biology uh, or uh, uh, that experience so you can find a postdoc and uh, place where there are more chemical bio, uh, more biology or uh, medical applications and that way you can bring the two expertise together so when you go out so you are neither a um, person of the advisor or not the postdoc but you are now a different person and that field will stand out uh, so it is important to find something niche in my own experience i started working my phd was uh, just working with solar cells and other things some uh, photochemistry so i developed expertise in spectroscopy in my first postdoc and electrochemistry in the second postdoc and that way i can do after coming here uh, photoelectrochemistry and colloidal semiconductors and believe me when i'm doing spectroscopy of colloidal semiconductors in the entire world in 1983 there were maybe three groups and people were giving me a hard time how do you explain this result uh, these particles cannot absorb light so i got all the reviewers comments it's very fun to read now but again you have to stand for yourself you know when you are doing this thing if you believe in it uh, stick to that bucket uh, if you think that you are going to contribute and uh, uh, you have to have one common bucket that will take you all along but at the same time you explore uh, different uh, things can i can i make a comment on that yeah sure yeah. Uh, okay just to to comment one thing that is i think it's very important for students particularly those in interdisciplinary fields is that you have to learn to communicate because the language is between areas are so different and also the methodology <laughs> i work with biologists so I, i can i can tell you that but you learn so much in trying to do that because you 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 improve your communication skills as well right you, you so need to go and talk to different people you need to go and talk to different people mm -hmm. their approach is different as you said methodologies are different uh, that's yes. what i pick up you know i may be in an organic seminar or some biochemistry but sometimes they use some different approaches that you can bring into your lab the same approach to tackle a problem but keeping your bucket <laughs> thank you i think we are approaching the end but monica stay here because it's, it's also a question for uh, Mo professor monica cota is also associate editor uh, of ACS uh, applied and materials and i have i want to put some pepper and in, uh, in this discussion <laughs> this is about the, this is about the bias um in publication especially in high impact journals uh the bias um with uh, scientists from developing country and, and also from female scientists so what were the journals um uh, are doing in order to to for fight against this bias and For instance, for my, for my case, I'm Brazilian uh, a female scientist. Um, it, it's, it's not easy. It's, I think it's, the, the path is, is much harder for us than is for a, a scientist in a developing country. So I would like to, that you both could comment. Uh, you want to go first or should I go? I, I, I can go, go first. Go first and I'll-, I'll Okay, uh, number one. Uh, as an 
editor, uh, I can show you examples of papers, what we are looking for. Uh, the number one is important is the title, okay? That is the first attention that comes in. I'm not saying that make it fancier, keep it short to the point, okay? Uh, people write like three sentences of title. That is the first way it will not be considered. Uh, I always say that look for most read articles in any journals. Those are the good indicators how the title should be because they are most read because of the title. People click on it seeing the title. Uh, the second thing is the abstract. The abstract is the gateway because everyone reads that abstract. The third one is the figures. Okay, so I can give you on another time, another small Zoom meeting about the publication and how to make it effective. Because we see it all the time. Uh, there are routine papers, right? People write routinely, right? Uh, I get this battery paper. It's been very standard. Uh, first is they make some kind of particles or some material. Uh, then they have to characterize for SEM or TEM images. That's a figure number two. Figure number three is uh, uh, XPS. I don't know why they do XPS, but they have XPS. And the fourth figure is charge discharge curves. Paper after paper comes the same kind of a template. Go to organic solar cells. The molecule is slightly different with a functional group. But you look into the paper from the same group, it's like a template. And those papers get shot down right away. It doesn't matter which country it is coming from. You don't know how many papers we reject from the US and Europe. I can give you exactly, they are from the good lab because the reason is the PIs didn't even read the paper. If somebody writes a paper, they sign off and then send it. You can see the mistake. So uh, I can tell you, if you want to submit, send me your uh, preprint. I will comment on it, how to make it better. How about that? Thank no, you. it is not that I know it better. I'm, I'm not commenting on the science, but this is becoming really a big change is people, journals don't want to repeat the same kind of a work. They were looking for something different than what is there. Something new and exciting, give that spark. So uh, that is, uh, again, my read on it is I always say, uh, give me that spark you know for acs energy letters is uh, our acceptance rate is 15 percent and half the papers uh, i can tell you you will not even uh, want to read that paper these are so uh, like it's not badly written or science is bad but there is nothing new and exciting coming out of them so the same set of data you have to be, it is just like marketing, right? So the same, you want to give a gift to somebody. You are putting in a nice package, nice ribbon, and doesn't matter what's inside, you like it. So same way with the pa paper, you have to package it uh, nicely. Uh, I can give a, another talk on figures, how to draw good figures. This is becoming a lost art. If you are putting 20 panels in a paper, I'm not going to take that paper, believe me. People think that they can just put a lot of data and then, oh, the editor will take it. And then they will complain saying that, why didn't you accept this paper? I got so much data. You have a bias, right? No, your paper, I cannot understand anything in that figure. I, I can show you right now if you want to show it. But uh, uh, these are the paper that goes through. So it should be very focused, very simple, and the way you package makes a lot of difference. You give me, send me a paper, I will comment on it and, and you see the difference. I, I'm not going to correct any English or check or anything, but I will highlight what can be improved. The abstract is the major thing. People like to put a lot of stuff in the abstract. Don't put a lot of stuff. Put in a general readership where people can appreciate what's the new thing that comes out.
and the figures figures are the key because that's what you read whenever you read a paper first you read the title then you read the abstract that gives you a little more in depth and then you look at the figures and you want the figure to stand out and tell you the story and then if you like it you go and read those are the three things you pay attention and uh, another secret is any journal that you submit make sure you have at least two or three references citing to the journal that sort of brings the focus like if i write all physical chemistry related journals and submit to organic chemistry the editor is going to tell me that uh, it is not a good fit right monica um, i i think okay. I, I understood the the question a bit differently it's true that we have to you know uh, struggle a bit with our students with ourselves to improve the quality of the paper uh, the writing of the papers many times because the science sometimes is really good uh, and we struggle because we don't have english as a native language in brazil it's not as prevalent in other countries so it's really hard sometimes to i mean the practice is a bit harsher in brazil because you don't sometimes dominate the language but uh, I think uh, I understood Anna's Flavia concern about bias in publication because you are addressed, right? And I think this is something we need to look into it because um, we don't know for sure if it happens, right? We don't have data. We know there are less publications maybe in high impact uh, journals from you know some countries. But we don't know exactly, we don't have a model or we cannot separate parameters as, is it the address? Is it the quality of the science? Is it the quality of the writing? Uh, what is what is doing? Or is just the lack of investment on in that country for science? So this is question number one. Uh, how can, if we can adapt it? There are certain uh, publishers in particular in Europe who are making blind reviews, some other uh, journals who are making open reviews where people can put their names on it. So there are uh, some experiments going on trying to address these issues. But uh, it's really difficult. For example, if they do blind review, they remove the, the name of the authors or the addresses, also gender bias, right? Uh, you can always sometimes tell when the, the paper comes from because you go to the acknowledgements, you have like funding and, and all this stuff. So it's not really blind. So I think it's first a question of establishing if this is a, 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 an issue that we have to deal with as scientists. I mean, we have to look into the problem and, and see if it's uh, what comes out. But some, certain initiatives are, are really good. I mean, ACS Applied Any Materials, which is a new journal. It's started 2018. It's going to get its first impact factor next year. So uh, what we see is, for example, having me there increased a lot of the number of papers from Brazil. Because people write to me saying, okay, what do you think? Do you think this, this fits in your journal? They feel more comfortable in writing to me than to the editor in the US, right? So representation is a good thing. ACS also is investing a lot in diversity. I just made a diversity seminar. You know, I attended a, 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 a diversity seminar. So I think we have to pay attention to make representation valid, you know, so to get the best science of the world publishing the best journals. And, and, and that's how our as scientists we have, but we have to pay attention to these issues and, and first to determine how extensive they are, how prevalent they are. You know, I'm not sure that there, there is, I haven't seen any bias from in my, in the journal I, I work with, but, uh, also, we actually improve, try to improve statistics of different countries. You know, when you, there's a paper from a different country, you try to make it uh, go through if it's good enough. And and that's, a, a, I think, a, a policy that has to be uh, addressed and taken care of for people in the field, including ourselves. When we do that, because sometimes if we take a, a paper, look at a paper from a country that is, much different than ours, I'll, I won't name, <laughs> put names here. We always say, oh, this is from this country, right? And, and we do that all the time. We have this hidden bias that we don't notice we have. So I just think it's good to put this subject on the table and address it scientifically as we try to do with everything, okay? 
So I don't know. I think I think I know Anna. So I, I got the pepper. <laughs> what, you, what you said is right. Uh, things like ACS uh, is very concerned about the diversity. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, they're talking right now about uh, creating a panel and how to diverse. So uh, all the editor in chiefs are told to have more diverse group in their editorial board. Uh, we have got like in ACS energy letters, uh, we have got two from Korea, uh, one from China, uh, one from India, uh, three from Europe, and uh, only including me, three from US. Uh, so we want to get somebody, uh, uh, for example, I'm looking for a women editor who is active in batteries. If you have somebody in Brazil who is very active, let me know. Battery. See, we have got papers uh, coming in because we see the flow, uh, uh, the papers. Uh, right now we have only two editors in batteries and we are getting more than 40 percent of papers in batteries so, to handle it so typically i look at every paper and i sort of either highlight some good points or weak points and assign it to the editor so the other editor sees it and uh, then he makes it so it's actually looked by two editors in our journal and uh, we want to capture i'm saying new science and uh, uh, i have to admit that uh, the Chinese researchers have mastered how to present their work. And you see now in ACS applied materials, it is 50% papers are from China. Yeah. Uh, most of the ACS journal, 30% from China. They're pouring in a lot of money. And look at their graphics. Uh, look at how they, uh, good papers, and you're saying, they hire uh, private uh, agencies to, uh, again, I am not for it, but that's how they do it. Uh, so again, uh, depending upon uh, how uh, doing it, uh, most of the journal acceptance rate is around 20%. So it doesn't matter, whichever journal you take, it's, it goes down by 20% of the thing. So uh, like, for example, ACS publications, uh, they are, or even any other uh, nature journal, they don't want, once you submit a paper, they want to find a home within their uh, portfolio. So that's why when you reject, we transfer the paper to another journal. Like, uh, if we're not urgent, see like ACS Energy Letters, we say urgency is a factor. If you're a regular article, there is a, a uh, applied energy materials, we say make it as a full paper. So if that doesn't, uh, so we try to put it in a suitable journal and make a transfer suggestion based on it. Uh, Sometimes the JAXs, uh, pay, uh, they communicate with us and they transfer paper from JAX to us. So the publishers are encouraging to keep everybody within that family of journals. But unfortunately the authors, they want to go through the impact factor ladder and we can see that. And that is the wrong thing because if it doesn't fit in, it will get rejected, the impact factor. We get a lot of papers, nothing to do with energy, but they think the impact factor and submit it, then we have to tell uh, that it is not the right scope, but go to this materials journal. Because if you are, everything is a material characterization, it fits in better with a materials journal. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, uh, one of the things, every editor wants to, capture the best work okay it doesn't matter where it is coming from or who it is written so it just, you can give me one try and i will make a suggestion uh and in fact i from my journal a lot of people send me uh this one and i point out why or why it is not uh if it can be improved i make a suggestion Especially from India, as, as you mentioned, uh, as uh, having somebody from Brazil makes a difference. People from India, for example, they always send me, especially the younger scientists, you know, who are just getting in. Uh, what do you think about this? So I sort of okay, your abstract needs this mm -hmm. uh, thing. It is too broad or uh, too specific. Take out these words. Your figures, you know, like uh, there, how to make your figures better. Uh, so those kind of a simple suggestions.
Uh, we have a, in journal, we have a, I'm lucky to have one of a coordinating editor. She goes through every paper after revision. We make suggestion to improve the figures. Uh, you know, most of the time the captions don't match the figures. Uh, that is one of them. Another one, uh, these uh, wrong titles and units. Uh, so we ask them to correct it. Uh, so th those kind of uh, things are uh, uh, very uh, things. So uh, I have a talk on graphics. I have a talk on uh, how to write a good paper. I, I just pulled out only a small portion on these uh, papers. Uh, but uh, if it is in a live audience, people ask more questions. It's more, more interactive. It becomes very nice. Uh, maybe I can do it another time. But again, there is not a simple solution for. But the bias works for the other way around. I would say, is if you come from a well-established scientist or a lab, that gets sent for review. Mm -hmm. The uh, there must be a strong reason because they have already established thing, and those papers are usually well written. And well, they, they know how to play the game. That's what I'm trying to say. So many, many times the students from these groups, they have no idea what's the value of the, the work. They are so, the group always publish high impact factor papers and the students assume that the, whatever they do, will go there. So they lose the scale. There, there, the there, there, are, lot, there are a lot of, uh, we, we are, it's this sort uh, in the, our uh, uh, group meetings and people publish it and then we start wondering how come this paper got published in this journal with these many uh, wrong things, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. how did the yeah. reviewers just show? So again, uh, we try to do best, but there is, uh, uh, but again, uh, it's- you We're know, human I, beings. I, I, I <laughs> it too, you know, like I don't, I don't feel bad. So it's a, uh, uh, We're just human beings, we fail. Yeah, right, right. Uh, I, I, I just recently sent one to, Yes, and came back, and then uh, again, as usual, like one says yes, one says no, and then okay. Uh, but then I look back, and there were ways something I said may be confusing to the reviewer. So I rewrote some sections, and now I submitted to another place because those comments made me to uh, go back to this paper. What st statements confuse this reviewer? And I try to revise it and send it. So, so again, uh, I'm also part of the same thing. So again, we learn from things because right now what has happened is the reviewers don't read papers thoroughly. They don't have time. It is just exploding. So it is up to the researcher to maintain a high standard and make sure everything is right. Mm -hmm. And I always say that don't make uh, claims uh, for which uh, you don't have a supporting data. A lot of times people do mistakes. Uh, for example, they will say the title water uh, photoelectrolysis or splitting of water. That title implies that you measure hydrogen and oxygen yield. And what they have done is showing the uh, uh, JV curves or uh, the IV curves showing the oxidation reduction. That is now is an oxidation process, not an electrolysis. So the moment you say electrolysis, you need to capture and show me how much yield you are getting, what's the efficiency. Uh, another word is highly efficient. You know, everybody uses, uh, my joke is, uh, we have made so many highly efficient photocatalysts, but we have not solved the problem yet. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so avoid highly efficient photocatalysts. I feel like people are, obsessed with using that word and that sort of brings down the entire paper down and you use that thing so yeah especially when you look at the i think you made a comment on twitter about the co2 photo reduction yeah about the micromole of yeah, CO2. Right, right. You you know, know, the problem you know like uh, don't uh, uh, again it works in the beginning but don't carry it out in the, all the time so it's just, you have to that's the changing world you have to see uh, one of the titles, if you want to see, there is a, a journal, Jewel. Jewel, the editors work on every title. You write a title like that, your paper will go through smooth, believe me. Also, Nature Energy, I think they, they, they like to, to change the, the title as well. Yeah, I, I, I don't change the title, but if there is too long, I said shorten it and make it for broader appeal. Uh, 
uh, or sometime like this highly efficient take out the word so, our our deputy editor he he works on titles his titles are much better than most of the authors i always surprised because i read the author's title i don't understand and i look at his notes and say oh maybe a suggestion title would be this and everybody likes it you know you're not you don't need to to oblige but most people do because it's really really good you know so i yeah. think this is a skill i, I have not master yet yeah but it's really important the, the, the input from the from the editors this is really improve the, the quality of the of the paper especially if you if the paper is rejected when you it is it, this is i think it's important to read when paper is rejected you read the comments you know that you can take these comments you can improve your paper because sometimes our paper is just reject without i mean sometimes with even unfair comment and it's, it, this is very discouraging for the for the authors mm -hmm. so i think we're approaching the end of our webinar um thanks again for having it's me very it's nice nice talking to you both of you and yeah. hopefully we'll meet personally so about yeah. how writing papers and yeah. advice for the PhD students it was a very nice talk professor prashant thank you monica for joining us today thank you and thank you, looking forward to meeting you in person i hope that somewhere this year i hope so unfortunately uh we, we had to postpone the Iguazu Falls for 2022, but the Brazilian MRS is going to be online this year. But we count we offer presence next year. Sure, sure. Thank okay. you. So we'll be we're still trying to make our CINI uh, conference uh, in person in October. Okay. okay. That's if you can do it. Okay. So I, I think it is the travel becomes fine and I'll come. Yeah. I think that the audience today, and uh, I hope to see you in our next senior webinar. Thank so you. thank you, Monica. Thank you, Prashant. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.